But Johannes, maybe you can introduce yourself and we'll go from there. I, I know I have a, a, a crypto hedge fund speaking later. Uh, so, but uh, feel free uh, and uh, please introduce us to the concepts. Thanks. Johannes, are you there? I want to make sure, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure my screen is up. Is that uh, yes, shared yes, with everybody? Yes, we have your shared screen. Thanks so okay, much. Okay, great. Thanks a bunch. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today um, and, and understanding perfectly that we have a, a crypto hedge fund coming up a little bit later. I will uh, table some of the, the deeper discussions on, on um, the, the things that I expect to be covered uh, with uh, with their presentation. Uh, so, you know, my goal is going to be today just to to cover um, you know some of the the core oversight uh, views of what's going on within Bitcoin, and what's going on within crypto generally, as we all consider uh, you know making you know potentially you know, these sorts of strategies a part of our portfolios. And you know, going through any sort of a, a, a process as as we do, you know, I like to go through the organization portion, and we want to analyze and strategize before we do any sort of commitment. And uh, a big part of that is from our standpoint, um, you know, how do we construct a, a reasonable sleeve? And over the years, having worked with family offices and, and um, different investors, you know, we're taking a look at that. Uh, that sleeve can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, you know, direct investments into businesses that are operating within the space, but it can also mean, you know, how are we going to construct the portfolios within our, uh, our own portfolio structures, whether they be trusts, whether they be foundations and so forth. So, um, you know, when we're, we're facing the same uh, dilemma within our offerings towards our own clients, how do we want to structure these things? How do we evaluate them and so forth? So what I'm going to do is, is take a view from a thousand feet here. Um, I did put forth a handful of questions. Um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Bill was able to get any of those, but you know, just trying to get a sense of the audience here. I'm going to presume a little bit uh, that we have a... Um, you know, at least some understanding of what's been going on in the marketplace. Everybody's heard about uh, Elon Musk and all that. If you haven't, you've been living under a rock. Um, we've seen a lot, uh, lot happening increasingly, really ramping up into the end of the year. So uh, I, I'm going to shift gears though before that and, and talk a little bit about, uh, this, is, this is Pittsburgh. This is where I'm from. This is where I'm based out of. And uh, it's a beautiful town. It's um, a wonderful, uh, great place to visit. Uh, all my friends who come through here love it. Um, a lot of times I take buddies to, to, to PNC Park, get a great uh, view of the city, and it's really considered to be, if not the most beautiful, e easily among the top three to five uh, in, the, in the country and arguably in the world. I mean, that's a, you get a nice day. That's, that's a heck of a view. You can also jump up, um, uh, go up, this is what they call the incline, up to, the, to Mount Washington, and uh, uh, you get a view of the city from above. And uh, one of the best places to take a romantic date or friends who are visiting in town is, is, is up on Mount Washington for dinner where you can look down on the city which just keeps the operating below and it's a it's a beautiful town um now one of the biggest complaints i would always get though anytime i had visitors coming through and if you talk to any pittsburghers is cabs now this is not pittsburgh this is new york city in this image and we're seeing a lot of cabs driving around here this is the exact opposite of Pittsburgh when it came comes to cabs. At least it was about a decade ago. Anybody who would come through would know that uh, getting a cab was virtually impossible, unlike a lot of cities where you can just sort of put your hand out on the street and grab a cab. Pittsburgh was a, a, a city where you had to make phone calls, try to arrange for cabs, and then maybe on a Friday night, uh, you could get a cab if you were in the right spot. But generally, it was long lines, waits, and virtual scarcity, uh, so much to the point where um, you actually had Yelp. This is Yelp, Yellow Cab, uh, our, our local taxi company here in Pittsburgh. That's its ranking, right, when it get, get reviewed. And um, you start looking at how severe that was for the reviews. It was because they just did things like not showing up, and uh, this review says it all. Now, uh, this is a point to this discussion. Um, the point is, is that uh, you're basically looking at what was going on with the cabs in Pittsburgh. It was an issue not of really the, the marketplace. It was an issue of two entities, the city of Pittsburgh and the state of Pennsylvania. And in, in, in many ways, the yellow cab was a protected sort of local regional cartel in Pittsburgh. And every city has this to some extent. But in Pittsburgh, anytime somebody cropped up as a matter of competition, they were uh, politely uh, reminded that it was not legal and asked to leave. And this was the status of, of Pittsburgh cabs for, for decades. And it was miserable um, and it affected people on Friday nights. It, it, it um, was uh, uh, argued that it, it potentially led to more drunk driving on weekends where people couldn't get cab rides. So they waited so long. Um, people weren't getting to the airport on time, all sorts of complaints. And it was steady that, you know, you just didn't wait around for the cabs. You waited to get uh, your friends up in the morning to take you to the airport and drop you off. Uh, then one day, 
We all know what that is, and I think you all know what's going to happen. Without any expectation, suddenly on people's phones in the Pittsburgh area, we saw these entities appear. Sorry, I've got a couple of chocolate labs who like to pop up. If you've watched my visual there, I had to correct my dogs that believe when I'm talking there, I'm talking to them uh, as opposed to my screen. But in any event, these showed up and all of a sudden we saw a huge flow of everybody going to these apps and it was just an overwhelming just flood of use. And there was this great big gasp of relief in the Pittsburgh region when suddenly people could get transportation. Drivers were suddenly matched with, with the, the need. And within, within minutes, within days, um, there was a just, you could, everybody was talking about it. And uh, uh, within months, drunk driving episodes started dropping. The police were getting fewer pullovers. All these sorts of things were resolved. And the key thing here that I'm, I'm going through this exercise is to point out is that uh, this wasn't an issue of adoption of, you know, sticking around with old technology. This was a, 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 an issue of really, um, you know, problems in the middle of transitions and, uh, you know, prevention of actual fluidity in marketplace. And um, it's also a story in how quickly things can change when we talk about shifting over from one side of this, this uh, column over to the other, in essence, that one day people just woke up and decided to say it didn't matter what the state of Pennsylvania and their regulations were saying. And then believe you me, they were a little bit upset and didn't know what to do. But in the end, they had to acquiesce because change was coming, whether they liked it or not. And the people had spoken with their feet and they dared not get in the middle of it. To this day, Uber and Lyft are operating just fine in the city of Pittsburgh. Now, we've seen other changes like this happen. This is the Berlin Wall, as we, we probably can recognize today. People walk around it. Of course, there's those awful images over the years. Uh, they keep it around just to keep you know, a reminder that one, you know, not too long ago, 1989, before that, you really couldn't just walk across the, the border into, into uh, one side of Berlin to the other. Uh, we had the whole uh, Soviet bloc, all that going on. Uh, and then one day, um, things just started changing. People were on top of the wall. Uh, within three years, all of a sudden, the Soviet Union is gone between 1989 to 1991, and we have this whole change. So a big part of taking a look, I think, at blockchain and and uh, uh, bit, uh, things like Bitcoin and crypto is really, you know, rethinking your perceptions about what is exactly going on, what's potentially possible. And I think about the other side of it, this is one of my favorite quotes here from Borstein, the greatest obstacle to discovering the shape of the earth, the continents and the, the ocean was not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. And we have to be careful about our, our, our presumptions and that overbearing weight of thinking we understand something when something new comes along. And um, I think that's directly meaningful for Bitcoin because over the last number of years, when every time I've talked to people about it, some of the smartest people I know, there's just been this reflex of just indifference to it and a general uh, feeling that, you know, this is this can't work. And they have, you know, very much a, 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 these preconceived notions of what it, what, it, what it is. And I know that because, uh, and I can relate to it because I went through that same process myself over the years. I think the other side of it is also keeping in mind you know, we have these big blind spots in, in the market uh, oftentimes. And, uh, you know, Big Short is famous for, uh, for um, in hindsight, you know, showing what everybody was 2020. But at the time, you know, these guys going around trying to sell their strategies were given the tinfoil hat uh, treatment by uh, most everyone who just thought it was lunacy. So uh, what exactly is going on? Tesla's buying 1.5 billion in Bitcoin. We all heard that going down, but it's been more than just that. Uh, back in uh, just the last month uh, or two months ago, uh, Mass Mutual is investing over 100 million in Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Uh, there's talk among other insurers about creating Bitcoin and, and, and crypto denominated type policies or backed policies. Um, and you're seeing this happening all the way through Druckenmiller. Uh, and you can just go on micro strategy. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, over the last couple of years has made some very uh, uh, big investments and uh, PayPal's now going, all these things are coming together. JP Morgan even acquiesced from saying, uh, you know, Diamond saying it was a fraud to now uh, they're going to have to be involved with it. Um, there's clearly something going on here. And I would distill it down, in, in, if I was going to say very simply, a, a big push towards disintermediation. We all know disintermediation. <laughs> This intermediation, nothing new for any of us. Um, great example here is, you know, the blockbusters and the, uh, the cable companies, and even increasingly so, especially with the the big nudge of COVID, uh, cinemas, you know, are all distilling down into, you know, family night around Netflix and Hulu and and and, and go tos like that. Um, and it's a big change. So, you know, uh, um, understanding what's happening with all of this is that. 
I'm going to also say that another part of this is, um, you know, you're thinking about it, you're, you kind of have to go down the rabbit hole with this a little bit, because when you're talking about really big changes sometimes, um, that can really involve having to sort of question your reality to some extent. So um, I always say we have to be careful when we get into this sort of position, because there's also the corollary to that where, uh, you know, the Red Queen is running, you know, the faster you run, the slower you go. And there's so much to this that you can get lost in it. Uh, so the goal here is going to be to distill that as, as best we can. And um, you know, what I want to be able to do here is uh, I'll get rid of that poll. Um, uh, let's talk about what is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a collection of very specific concepts and technologies intended to enable a philosophy of what money and banking should aspire to be. Um, that's a big sentence, but I think it very concisely says what it's intended to do. Uh, as such, Bitcoin is a protocol that forms a digital money ecosystem that is self-regulating, immutable, impermeable, decentralized, and permissionless. Now, when I talk about things being revolutionary and having to think things through, those are two big statements. And we have to really keep in mind you know, what that can mean in the bigger picture. Um, and, I, and I, one thing I also want to draw attention to is that I, I, I phrase this as a digital money ecosystem. Um, and sometimes people will talk about that in two different ways. One is Bitcoin with a capital B, and the other is Bitcoin with a small b. One refers to an overall infrastructure of a system. And then the other one is sort of this Bitcoin, this coin, this you know thing that we visualize as a, as a piece of gold or as any sort of monetary unit. So let's take a look at some of the, the five features. And my slide apparently is jumping up here ahead of schedule here. Let's start with uh, the, the left side, uh, open source. Um, anyone can access Bitcoin, anyone can spend it, anyone can receive it, anyone can run its protocol, any person or app can play. This is truly open source. It's actually a protocol that runs out on the system. It's run by the community and it does what, what it does just purely um, out there. It's, uh, it's, it's just open and distributed to anybody who wants to play with it. Uh, it's decentralized. As I just said, Bitcoin is not owned by any corporation or government. It belongs to the people who use it and care for it. It focuses on the preferences and interests of users. Uh, and no permissions for central authority is required. It's neutral in that capacity. Anybody can transfer anyone to anyone. It's any purpose, any size, from the smallest to the biggest. It can you know, carry uh, mega transactions or now all the way down to a few dollars. Uh, and it executes indifferently and always honestly. On that last point, auditable transparency. This thing is self-auditing 24-7, 365 days a year. This thing is constantly going every 10 minutes, ticking along. Uh, it's an open source ledger. So when I say open source before, this ledger is published on the internet, it's out there and it's being constantly run. And there is a degree of anonymity to it. You know, to the extent that when you have an open source ledger, there's a bunch of numbers that are attached to every transaction and it can be audited all the way back to the very first original Bitcoin to exist and every transfer thereafter. Uh, but it's technically anonymous. Now, people who are in the business of figuring out who's who know how to get in there and they can start tracking these sort of things. So I, I caution anybody who thinks this is some easy way to just be totally fraudulent. That's not the case. There are, are, are firms out there who will go out there and if they really want to drill into it, they can start doing that sort of thing. And, and criminals who think that they're getting away with it, it's really not a great place to have every transaction you've ever done with a criminal uh, intent to be out there because when it gets pieced back together, there are potentially problems. Uh, the last thing is it's mutable. Fraud proof, censorship proof, does only what its owners request. It's honest, it's predictable in terms of circulation, hour to hour, week to week, year to year, and it's bailout proof in that respect. Meaning, unlike our current system of money, where the Fed literally is going to the digital uh, um, keyboard there and it can create credit by the trillion out of thin air. Um, this thing is really just not gonna be uh, tweaked. It's, um, it's there, uh, Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. It's only operating within these five principles. And in that respect, if somebody wants to, to borrow that money or to use it for another purpose, is they actually have to ask you. They just can't, in essence, do what the Federal Reserve does, which is you know, print a, a tremendous amount of credit and money, and in essence, leach that wealth out of your pocketbook. And that's a very powerful strategy, uh, or rather a very, very powerful feature 
but it's also, you know, as you can imagine, a uh, uh, an issue that's potentially um, uh, controversial. Now, what is it? Uh, I mentioned it's a protocol. Uh, it's constantly running. It's out out, out there in distributed network. It's being run um, by miners and uh, nodes. Uh, the total supply of Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. There will only be 21 million. It's uh, each one of those million, uh, each one of those actual Bitcoin is divisible by a million. So it's uh, not as if there's a you know just a limited supply and only 21 you know million people can own one Bitcoin each or someone can corner the whole market. Um, cor the current float is about 19 million. Uh, in other words, all of those uh, 19 million uh, have already been mined. The final 2 million Bitcoin will be distributed or mined over the next 100 years. And how it works basically is every 10 minutes, um, miners are basically going out there and using a cryptographic math uh, to verify information that is falling into this open ledger. And before it can be verified, it has to be in essence solved. It's a very elegant sort of process. And uh, in essence, what they get out of that is uh, as a reward, uh, uh, potentially for Bitcoin uh, or else potentially feed fees. And all of this is without getting too much under the hood, the way that Bitcoin is basically carries all those five features that I said before. Now, I'll just add one thing. It estimates about a $30 billion cost to falsify just a transaction to try to insert it. That means you have to really go out there and buy a tremendous amount of computer power, uh, a lot of equipment, and that just gets you in there for one transaction. And every 10 minutes, this thing's cycling in there. You, the, the ship has just sailed. Catching up is almost impossible. So let's talk about what it actually does here, because I think this will actually give us a perception of what's happening, not just with within Bitcoin, but also within crypto across the board. Um, now, keep in mind, Bitcoin is the originary crypto. It is the 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 top uh, first uh, uh, almost genesis concept in this technology and in, in binding all these different technologies together into one form uh, unit. So uh, it, you, there's a lot of different ways people phrase this, but I think banking 2.0 kind of carries along. You know, we talk about net 2.0, this is banking 2.0. And this just shows you a basic comparison of the two systems out there, the current existing legacy system system we all work with and the Bitcoin system. In this case, we've got Maria on one side, Mark on the other side, and Maria wants to send some money to Mark. Um, she basically, the process is going to be through the traditional layer is she may, uh, you know, go down, write a check or whatever she wants to do, but it's going to go through her bank. It's then going to transfer over to Mark's bank. They're going to do a little handshake there. And then that money is going to get into Mark's hand. He can do what he wants. Um, now, um, with Bitcoin, it's a little bit different. Now, in this case, Maria, she's gonna to have to own some Bitcoin. So one way or another, she owns it. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But when Bitcoin starts transferring, Maria basically has Mark's uh, information for his Bitcoin, uh, or at least rather for his wallet where he keeps his Bitcoin. And um, she simply transfers it and Bitcoin handles that. The protocol does it. There's no my bank, your bank. There's no transition between the banks, which is a little bit of that intermediary layer, which can thicken depending on the transaction. It just happens. Bitcoin does it for us. Um, and that doesn't matter where uh, where Mark is, right? So we take a look at some of the other ways these transactions can happen. You know, initially the very first Bitcoin was spent on pizza. Um, it was sort of a test case. Someone bought some, you know, I think they spent like 10 Bitcoin for a pizza. <laughs> uh, hindsight, uh, you know, everything's uh, anything. I joke, I, I first learned about Bitcoin, I think it was around $3 and I didn't understand it um, and I didn't buy any of it. I think I might've even tried to buy it, but it was so complicated, I passed on it. But, you know, most people who look at Bitcoin today, um, if you looked at it at $3, you probably would have sold it at 100. And I kind of, you know, applied that salve to my, myself in terms of how much I could have bought. But the okay. bottom line is- it, we're, we're a little bit over time. Is, can we cut this in a minute or two? Uh, well, I, yeah, let me let me try to condense this quickly, because I think this is the premise of really what we're looking at here. Uh, I'll, I'll try to shorten this down uh, within five um, to, just to give it some uh, consolidation. But what we're functionally looking at is that transaction goes straight into a pizza. Um, and now cases we, today that now is, uh, as we heard, Tesla. Tesla is talking about accepting Bitcoin. I think the bigger picture is that when we take a look at where this is going to evolve, Tesla is going to be shifting. That, mon that money that traditionally would go through that intermediary layer, transmission of the complex goes through here, the, the, the US bank, the Tokyo bank, a lot of, um, you know, for, for a typical business, there's a lot of uh, uh, layer in there. And ultimately that money gets to Japan, whereas Tesla, it's just no different than Mary or Maria sending the money around. And I think that ultimately 
what we're talking about there is a big layer of counterparty risk, which is you know, a big part of the issue within this environment. Now we can talk about how all this works for friends and family. We can talk about how this works for privacy. Uh, Maria has somebody in India who she wants to work with and maybe her family did, you know, frowns on that particular religion or whatever it is. All of that can happen with Bitcoin. Uh, legal cannabis um, can be a problem. Now technically illegal cannabis can be a problem. Um, but right now the system doesn't permit those things to happen. And even things like, you know, our, our friend, family in Venezuela, right now our banking system does not permit that, but Maria can help out, you know, in struggling family in Venezuela, uh, Tehran, all that kind of stuff. So let me get through this really quickly here, uh, so that we can, we can move on. And I, I, I appreciate that we're, we're up against the time constraint. Um, I will just go through uh, the, the, the term that's been used uh, most recently. This is the, the comptroller of the US, Brian Banks, self-driving banks. Uh, I think that's basically what we're looking at within the disintermediation in all of crypto. Um, disintermediation, really, when we talk about the internet, is the rails of the internet. You know, communication, we saw it happen with mail, uh, you know, shifting over from email to snail mail. Uh, away from snail mail. Uh, we're seeing at meetings right now, what we're doing right now was you know, previously inconceivable. And we see this also uh, helping with some concerns Uh, seeing it also within, um, you know, areas where uh, you get the funneling of all sorts of uh, aggregation of business through onto the same rails of the internet. Uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook are great examples of just totally controlling large swaths of the business model in their relative sectors and piping that information through the internet and, and making billions of dollars off of it. Uh, similarly, we see this in the financial services and um, you know, all of a sudden you have Bitcoin coming along, which it, in and of itself is entirely different. It is the rails. It is the rails of monetary transmission. Shifting gears here quickly, and then I'm going to wrap this up for you all. Uh, Ethereum and things like that, they are just a different way of looking at that. When you start talking about other crypto, um, Ethereum basically, these are all Ethereum-based tokens that are all based off of that. So Ethereum creates a rail that you can, in essence, rent and create for whatever purpose that might be. Um, we're seeing entity level securitization, things like Tesla could be possible as its own security, Dole or Exxon, any one of these things. And really what we're then seeing is the potential for smart, smart type securitization where even Reg D type securities are offered. And you can have all of these different functionalities attached to a particular Reg D offering as its own, in essence, Bitcoin. Uh, and it can be smart programmed. Um, you can have different tokens that permit for uh, things like uh, accredited investors, KYC, all these things start coming together. So I know um, I'm short on time here and I'm gonna have to wrap up. So I guess what I would say is we take a look at these marketplaces, we consider what basically is going on in this marketplace and we think it through the lens of past models and how everything is shifting over to these different rails that are entirely independent. And I think that what you're gonna wanna consider is that these things are, um, are they're going to be out there um, when you're looking at investing in them um, you can look at them through through uh, in a lot of different business models you can look at them through asset allocation technology uh, through modern portfolio theory but I also think that when we're you know looking at the future th this is this is where things are going um, it's going to be controversial there's a lot of risks that are involved with it when you consider Bitcoin um, you know how do you evaluate all those things need to be considered I think if you're going to have a prudent process around that but uh, knowing we're short on time I'm going to wrap up I could talk obviously for a long time on this um, as needed but um, if you have any questions be sure to let me know maybe I I can't open it to a couple questions if there are any. Um, I just don't think we have time. We're really, we're 10 minutes over on that one, but, but Johannes, listen, really great presentation. Thanks so much. I, I do have only uh, one comment on, on um, Bitcoin, which is that uh, before Tesla's treasury bought Bitcoin, Elon Musk got on Twitter and talked the value of Bitcoin down. And I think it went from 40,000, like 30 something thousand or less. And then a couple of weeks later, he reveals that his company had bought at the dip um, and now it's up at 50,000 or something like that. So, so I guess the question is how many other companies are doing that on the slide who are buying it that we just don't know about yet? 
Yeah, um, I think I think what we're looking at is you know a big um, push in from big investors, and uh, one of my slides uh, shows a little bit of a gap. It's sort of that adoption gap where early adopters start shifting over, and we have that gap as to you know what ultimately is transitioning there. So uh, it's happening. The, the 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 thousand Bitcoin purchase owners are increasing. So these are higher net worth people stepping in presently, whereas it used to be the the fringe people doing it a little bit here or there. In the last year, we saw some of the billionaire early adopters, some family. Uh, offices stepping in, um, some big tech personalities. But now when you have this happening with you know, Tesla and so forth, it's going on and these dips are going to be volatile. Uh, um, like anything, nothing goes parabolic and lasts for long. Uh, but I think you're going to see as more people get their head around the philosophy of what this is and really the revolutionary technology and the potential for autonomy. And I think that, you know, I say the term autonomy, I think really even if from a fiduciary standpoint, this asset class provides protections for our, our wealth in ways that we cannot protect our traditional wealth, whether it's through custody, whether it's from political risk and financial risk. You know, I sometimes joke, Bitcoin's a little bit of, a, it's like you can't short anything right now because, because of all the Fed intervention. Bitcoin is kind of shorting the US government and Fed policy uh, if you believe that you, know, you just can't print money and go in debt forever. Um, yep. You know, that's a little Fantastic. bit of, you know, 